Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, the reality is, icons aren't made, but they're born. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, influences, and so very much more, in a light and conversational fashion, and, uh... Cause that's how we do it, and if you like how we do it, we'd really appreciate it if you would uh, subscribe to the podcast. You're already halfway there, you're listening to us, uh, and if you need to do that, you can find us basically uh, wherever your podcasts are found. Uh, Apple, Spotify, uh, Google, uh, I'm forgetting one, probably, but uh, yeah, and they're all there, and uh, you can also find every single one of our episodes archived over at our YouTube channel. Also, we'd really appreciate it if you'd follow us on social media. You can do that either at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of updates. And finally, and I dare say most importantly, please come pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca for all the latest and greatest movie news and reviews from the world of entertainment, television, film, and beyond because we love talking about the moving image and we love it when you read about it. All right, on this episode, we've got an interesting one. We are uh, diving into the world of Rudy Ray Moore, the icon himself. Uh, And we are talking uh, with the author of said book, Mr. Mark Jason Murray, which in the book is called Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself. And it is uh, the official authorized biography of Rudy Ray Moore, a.k.a. Dolomite. Uh, And it's one of those things where he, he, and really, if you don't understand sort of what a self-starter and how unique of an entertainer Rudy Ray Moore was, then I recommend checking out this book, and I recommend checking out a lot of things like the Netflix film, and even even some of his uh, comedy album work, because they need to be heard and they need to be seen to really be believed. And we talked with uh, uh, Mark about his uh, sort of uh, getting to know Rudy, because he's known him for quite some time and worked with him, and uh, just sort of talk about the Kickstarter for uh, getting everything going on funding this. There is a few more days left on uh, on uh, being involved in this if you want to, and we will have all that info in our uh, uh, description of this episode. But uh, we had a great talk with Mark. The audio wasn't the best, but uh, it's still a pretty interesting talk, and it definitely shines a little bit of light into... Uh, the icon that was Mr. Rudy Ray Moore, a.k.a. Dolomite. So I hope you enjoy this talk, because I certainly know that I did. All right, whenever you're ready. All right, well, I mean, obviously, first off, just thank you thank you very much for the time, man. I really do appreciate this. No, I, I appreciate it as well, dude. Now, I mean, I was going through the press release and doing my research, and, like, I'm kind of curious. When did the germ of, or I guess, or the idea of you writing a book about Rudy start because it's true you worked with Rudy like it wasn't just this wasn't just a pure research thing you had been working with Rudy for years well I started out as a fan um literally this has taken me 30 years to get to this point um 1981 I'm 17 years old I was pretty versed in cult cinema and obscure movies uh, even at that early age uh, I was doing rental by mail and getting all kinds of crazy stuff that was was uh, beyond my age at that point uh, and called and, and just said you have to see this movie that I just rented and I literally drove over to his house he passed the window the, the video out of his window like I didn't even turn the car off I just pulled up to the curb he passed the video out the window went home and watched it it was dolomite <laughs> and it was kind of uh, it's it's it was an experience unlike anything I had seen before a lot of people have memories of that first time they saw a Rudy Ray Moore movie. And it was just otherworldly, I guess, is kind of a, a good term for it. There was nothing like it. Uh, in, in reality, even 30 years later, I still don't really see anything that's, that's like the Rudy Ray Moore cinematic world. And after I saw it, to find out everything I could. And I had stumbled on some comedy records. Didn't really realize that he was a comedian. 
know, the only frame of reference I had or point of reference I had was just Dolomite. Mm. So then I started discovering he had other movies. He had comedy albums. And then once I discovered he had comedy albums, it was like, man, this guy's got like 20 some of them. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Then you start to discover that he was a singer in the 50s and 60s. And that was something that at that time he had given up on. He didn't even mention that. There were hints that he was a singer on some of his comedy albums. He would do a, a sort of an X-rated version of one of the songs he may have done in the 50s or 60s. It just all of a sudden expanded into this, this giant world of Rudy Ray Moore. And I was lucky enough to stumble upon an address a couple years later, and it turned out to be Rudy's. And I was doing a small uh, fanzine called Shocking Images. It was uh, you know, horror and, and cult movies and things of that nature. And it turned out it was his address and he agreed to do an interview and you know the, the cliche term is the rest is history <laughs> after that we uh, my kind of goal was because it was such a struggle for me to find out anything about him that i kind of took it upon myself to be the you know the one to bring that information forward so we started uh, rudyraymore.com uh, in the mid 90s that was a way for him to promote his appearances and sell his merchandise. Uh, I'll never forget, uh, he was over at my house and I was trying to show him his website and he just had zero concept of the internet. I don't think Rudy ever owned a computer. Uh, if I had to communicate with him or send him materials, I had to fax it to him. Uh, I just remember him sitting there just looking at the computer just with no concept of what it was. And I had to try to explain, well, you know, this page, think of this as a table of contents click on chapter two and it's going to take us into that information and so he, he he had figured it out but uh i just continued to to promote him and, and support him any way that i could um not really i wasn't like a manager or anything but i was just more like an alliance with him getting him booked at conventions and and i mean i even had people that contacted me and i booked him for some guy's bachelor party in las vegas <laughs> that's wild so it just, it just blossomed from there. And in 2001, uh, he agreed to allow me to write his, his biography. And so much information was elusive, especially after he passed in 2008, that uh, it, it took me this long to, to make that story happen. And it was inspiring and interesting enough for me to spend three decades of my life putting it together. Well, and I mean, there is this thing about Rudy and his legacy, which... People like us, like on the outside, I mean, on one end, I mean, like you say, you can't explain Dolomite to people. You just have to show Dolomite to people for them to truly yeah. understand what it was. But people will never, like, it's hard to really sort of encapsulate, like, just sort of the work ethic of the man and just sort of his willingness not to stop when it comes to sort of the entertainment industry. I mean, and that that's one of the things, at least for me, I've always kind of admired about him. And I'm kind of curious, how much of a sell was it for you to sort of get him to really chronicle sort of everything that he did? Because I'm sure it was quite a bit. Uh, that was actually a real struggle. <laughs> uh, Rudy was very private. Uh, you know, initially when we talked about the book, he, he wanted it to basically be like a fluff PR piece of just, you know, saying Rudy Ray Moore is the greatest comedian and filmmaker and actor of all time. And, and of course, uh, uh, none of those things are, are uh, accurate. <laughs> yeah, I'll be perfectly honest. I mean, he, he is my idol. Um, and the, the struggle was to really get him to open up. He was incredibly private. His career was everything to him. So anything that he wasn't uh, interested in revisiting, he just pushed to the side, uh, personally and professionally. He, he never, like I said, never really told anybody that he was a singer at all. And I didn't find that out until after I already was in contact with him. And then in 2000, I believe it was, Norton Records put out uh, a compilation of a large portion of his 50s and 60s vocal works and then all of a sudden it was like he had a secondary career as a singer and being a singer was really all he ever wanted to be he was doing comedy and singing and it was uh, i mean he's even done dancing uh, 
he told me he even did fortune telling for a while, anything that he could to try to get into show business. And when he finally found that thing that stuck, which was his comedy, that's just where he, you know, that's, that was his career trajectory at that point. Well, and he's such an interesting guy because I mean, when you just look at the arc of like just the albums that he released and just sort of the timing of everything, it really does feel like that without Rudy, there might not be a Richard Pryor. Without Rudy, there might not be a Chris Rock or a or a variety of different other people. Did did Rudy have sort of an understanding of sort of his place in sort of the pop culture legacy, especially when it comes to comedians? Yeah, he did. Um, I, Ru Rudy's uh, opinion of himself uh, was often you know, loftier than reality. And that's kind of the beauty of Rudy. He just, he, he was his best cheerleader. You know, he would always, you know, the, the, the terms came where he'd be considered the king of the party records and the godfather of rap. And, and to a large degree, um, those are entirely accurate. Um, when he did Eat Out More Often, it wasn't his first comedy album. It was in 1970, but on the cover of it, he says, you know, the first Read Read More album and, and the second album says the second album that came out right after that. But he had done some tame uh, double entendre comedy and, and things in the 60s. One album is all about beatnik jokes, which was uh, outdated probably before the record even hit the shelves. Uh, mild stuff. And he actually got inspired by Jimmy Lynch, who was a close friend that worked on all of Rudy's films and, and was a, a large part of Rudy's life when they met in 1969. But Jimmy had done a comedy album where he, he did a joke and it had, a, you know, an MF in it. And Rudy was selling that record decently when he worked at Dolphins of Hollywood in Los Angeles. So he thought, well, if Jimmy can say it once, and not go to jail. I'm gonna say it a thousand times and see what happens. So he took that that verbiage and also brought the uh, street folklore of the African American community and uh, you know put it on record. And it was something that 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 had never been available on a commercial level. And it took off. Well, I mean, and that was a big thing, I think, that the movie highlighted, because it really did sort of show sort of the birth of the character of Dolomite, I guess, would be the right way to put it. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious how, because I mean, I know you were, you did, you did do some work on the movie, but I'm kind of curious for, for people on the outside looking in who don't know how true to life did they manage to capture that? Because I mean, especially when you're doing a Hollywood biopic, there's always going to be certain liberties taken. But I think I think people are curious to know how true the story they saw on screen is is to what actually happened. Well, like you said, there are liberties that are taken, and a large part of it is uh, generally accurate. Um, I was the, the main consultant for the movie, and my my book and the works uh, and insights were uh, you know a primary uh, reference source for the writers. Uh, so you know they they went right to the well to get the to get the water so to speak. Um, there there are uh, uh, the majority of the movie is accurate. There are some tweaks. You know they didn't meet Derville Martin in a strip club, but it makes for a great moment in the movie. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but there's also a lot of little things in there that nobody would know are accurate unless they were you know deeply entrenched in in the the actual making of the films or someone like myself who has analyzed every detail. You know when when he's uh, more often and they're having this little party in his apartment which is true um, they have him on a second floor and he did have a second floor apartment when he was recording those comedy albums that was before he moved into the Dunbar Hotel um, other little things like uh, they have a, a, a young uh, Asian woman as the sound girl on Dolomite and Carol Yazunaga was a young Asian girl who did sound on Dolomite so there's little tiny things that are in there that even people would not realize are accurate. And I really loved the movie even more after I saw that, that they really did pay close attention to things that no one would notice. You know, that, that, that gives me a lot of respect for films. Uh, I'll use uh, Straight Outta Compton as an example. When uh, 
the Easy E character goes and meets uh, what's his name, Jerry Heller, at a manufacturing place. They they had boxes with the Mahola Records logo on it in the background, which Easy E and all those rappers would go to have their records pressed in small quantities. Not that many people know that. You yeah. got to be knowledgeable to know that. So that's something that, that they could have easily not done in a movie. It just shows that authenticity that, that, that people go for. And there's a lot of that off this authenticity in Dolomite is my name. But I do, uh, you know, the challenge now is that a lot of people think they know everything about Rudy Ray Moore because they saw the movie. And that's really just a tiny fraction of his overall uh, life and, and story and career and legacy. Now, I mean, I know you're in the middle of a Kickstarter right now, just in terms of raising funds for the book, but I mean, it almost feels like Rudy would have, would have loved Kickstarter because I mean, really, when you look at the story of how he got Dolomite made, I mean, it's, and how he got it out there to, to screens, it really is in many ways, sort of, I guess the, I don't want to say the birth of independent cinema, but it is one of those things that really sort of created a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of how you can get, you know, your content to audiences and it doesn't always get the appreciation that it necessarily deserves because right. really at the time when he did that, that was kind of groundbreaking. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like I'm doing the modern Rudy Ray Moore routine. <laughs> Just, um, you know, he, he, I'm pounding the digital pavement trying to get people to support uh, this book. Um, I really wanted to do uh, a special like hardcore fan version that really was something that, that uh, I can be proud of and the fans can be proud of and that Rudy would be proud of. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's heavily illustrated. There's over 600 photos in it and the majority of it's in full color. Um, it, it goes through every part of his life from his, uh, you know, escaping abuse as a child and, and, and escaping poverty, uh, puts everything in his life and career in cultural and historical context. I mean, it really is a document of, of his life. Um, I've spent thousands of hours researching even the most minute details. And like when Rudy made that album, Eat Out More Often, he knew he had a hit. And his comment was, if you know you have something good, you take it to the people and they will decide. And so I'm kind of using Rudy's uh, you know, commentary and wisdom as a way to uh, help get this special version of his book uh, published well i mean and that's a great and it's an important way to be because i mean rudy really does have this sort of very significant and very uh important place in sort of pop cultural pop culture history that is goes far beyond the surface that people would see with the albums and the movies there really was a very sort of self-starter mentality that he had which rings true even today with like with something like the kickstarter just like with things that we see people doing all over the world yeah you know and, and i think even still today to to a large degree rudy uh is still considered kind of a novelty and there there really is more to him in his story um it's very inspiring it's uh you know his his failures far outweighed his successes times when he you know he, he teetered on being completely forgotten about i like to say that he owned the 70s you know 1970 he had his, his hit comedy album finally come out and then just this avalanche of comedy albums came out within the next couple couple years i mean he was putting out records like every three months approximately throughout the early part of the 70s and he he never gave up you know they don't they don't uh go into the, all the details of course of the making of dolomite but it took him over a year to get that movie on the screen. He literally had to go and when he ran out of money, he had to go on the road and he would make the money and he would send it back and they'd edit a little piece of the film and he'd get back on the road and get whatever money and he just kept kept pushing that boulder up the hill until he had something completed. And he, he really didn't have a choice to be honest with you because every penny he had was wrapped up in that film. It had to do something or he was he was busted. Why do you think we've lost that sort of don't give up mentality, especially when it comes to the entertainment business? Because there is always sort of the, you know, people want to go, they'll want to try something. Oh, I failed. I suck. And then they'll go away. But 
Rudy never went away. I mean, as much as he may have been, you know, had moments where he was almost forgotten, like you said, he he, he never kind of went away. And I'm kind of curious, why do you think we don't hear more stories like Rudy just just from the pure tenacity level of just not stopping? Well, like I said, he's, he's often just out of necessity. Um, Rudy uh, never really had many uh, regular jobs in his life. Right. He was at the record store, and, and once the comedy album hit, um, he had quit because he was off and running at that point. But, um, you know, in the 80s, uh, you know, where are you going to see Rudy Ray Moore working at? You know, he's not going to be working in an office or, you know, he, his, his only skill, I guess you could say, was being an entertainer. So in, in, in some levels, that's all he had, and he had to make that work. No, you're absolutely right. But, I mean, it's one of those things where, I mean, you have to recognize your skill set, and it's important to sort of lean into that and do the, make, make the most that you can out of it. And then Rudy definitely is very much an inspiration on that level. And I just want to say, you know, good luck with the Kickstarter, and, and thank you again for, you know, doing the work because, I mean, his, his story really is a fascinating one that I think more and more people need to hear about. Thank you. And, and if anybody's interested, the book's available uh, on the Kickstarter campaign through April 15th. And uh, you can get to the links through RudyRayMoore.com, which is his official website. And there's also links to all of his uh, social media that I run. So you can find him on uh, all social media at Real Dolomite. Um, so I just, uh, hopefully the fans will support and we can do this, uh, this special version that really honors Rudy and his life and his work. And, and you know, even after that, I'm still going to continue to uh, keep uh, his memory and his legacy alive. Keep doing the good work, man. And we'll make sure we put all those links uh, for the Kickstarter and for the social when we post this episode as well. Awesome. Thank you, David. All right. Thanks again, man. All right. You have a good one. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye. Bye. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.